Tai Chi Saber. Okay, everyone, we're back. We're back. The sword is my shepherd. <laughs> Hi. Okay, Susan, Bill, if you're watching, uh, thanks for all the support. Um, back with the sound, so I get to talk to you. Uh, whether you want to hear me or not, it's on. So, okay, we're going to start off, uh, you know, in the shoulder width stance and go through a few of these basic movements as we always do. And we grab the sword or switch hands. Grabbing sounds too physical. Chop, chop, poke, behind, up, beside, push. So that's basically what we're doing as far as the different maneuvers. You know, the thing is, when you start to move in directions, it seems like it's fairly complicated. But, you know, when you're doing these hand movements, if you know the form, basically, this is all you're doing, you know, going through the motions. So everything can actually be done within this space because everything is a relative position. As we move through the mapping of the form, we go into different corners. And, you know, there you have it as a basic... Um, forward, behind, right and left side movements, horizontal, obliques, you know, there's only so many things we can do in a direction and how many strokes can we have, you know. So to develop the consistency of the movements at 45 degrees or uppercut or over the top coming through your center, the, the coordination is what or tracking the body's movement is what is the most difficult part simply because we're dealing with space and our proprioception and our muscle memory and our joint positions are not really recognized uh, in the beginning because the body itself doesn't really know much until you kind of feed it the right information. So there's a lot of trial and error, a lot of experience that you gain from doing it over and over again. And, you know, that's just the nature of uh, how we learn. And by going through it, believe it or not, over time, your body will start assimilating the movements and it starts to pick up. There is a strategy. Uh, one of the things that we do a lot of is understand the geometry of position and then bring in some of the principles that we have in Tai Chi or in uh, any of the other systems that I teach because those concepts and theories have been um, built into our styles from the experience of the people that founded the systems or discovered them through their own uh, learning experience. And, you know, typically that's what it is. You know, a teacher gets a certain amount of knowledge, goes through that practice and training, with, regardless of what discipline it is, and you develop insights. Once you have enough insights and you have enough experience and have enough time uh, under your belt, then uh, people will start to listen to what you have to say as, as, a, you know, as guidance. So that's where books come from. That's where videos come from. The experiences of teachers experience. And if you can uh, pick up on what the teachers are trying to share with you, then you can uh, work with that. So the geometry of position, our center line, our square positions, uh, our circular movements is consistent regardless of whether it's Tai Chi, Kung Fu, Yerimon. They're all tied to what we're dealing with as the hardware. It's our skeletal structure. We have to deal with the skeleton and how we manipulate the musculature to create these positions based on what we think we see and what we hear. Um, unfortunately, a couple of weeks ago, we lost our audio, and I, I'm pretty sure without the audio, it was a lot harder to um, follow what's going on because it doesn't give you the second level of learning. So, you know, now that we have it back, it is a big advantage. So when we start off the form, just like in Tai Chi, we do the opening movement and we get to our neutral position. Here's your horizontal elbow, and as we turn, we separate the hands. That's not quite a diagonal flying. It's a pass-through 
to get to the grass the sparrow's tail. Okay, now once we finish to grass the sparrow's tail, instead of stopping in single whip, we hook the wrist and turn into a brush knee and push. And that's where we sit back, capture the sword in the opposite hand, and end up stepping up to suspended and push. Now you always want to set up your leg position before stroking across, simply because the base is critical in your stability. And when I sit back and I turn and I push forward, that gives me something to push off of and power really is generated in the legs. It's manifested in the hands as you describe the motion or in this sense is we're not articulating the movement using our fingertips or our palm, we're using this apparatus. And we turn and then we end up here. And I'm just going through the motions from different angles so you can see that this is what's happening. Sit back and we turn over the head we stab forward, we invert the sword, set up the elbow, chop down, shift the weight, and then come up and then back. Okay, so those are the basic strokes in the, the uh, saber. So we have the basic cut up, which is really on the right side. And then we go to the left side and we push it up. If I take it over the top, that's just a big circle. If you look at the movement, all I'm doing is a big circle. And where's the center of that circle is in my hand. And we're just slicing around. They're not exactly circles, it's, but they're arcs of a circle. Because you're projecting and you're moving in a direction, they become elongated. So it's like a, like a movement like that. So if you tied the two sides together, is basically a figure eight. And what's a figure eight is just a, like going through the infinity sign. One, two, three. Well, if I go to the side, you have a figure eight. So if I go like this, one, two, three, that's a figure eight. You see the, it's just that you're, you've changed the plane of movement and you've created the two sides of those circles. Those two sides of the circle merge in the center of the space. So it's like you have two circles here. Like, it's like being like a chariot. You're sitting here and you have the two circles on the two sides. And it projects in this direction because the, the wheels are rolling in that direction. Just like, like a wheelchair it does the same thing. You're moving. You know, a car is the same thing. It's has the wheels on the side, but it, in a, since a car has four wheels, but the, the idea is that if I do this and it merges, it's essentially a figure eight. Okay. If I go like this, essentially it's figure eight. So when I go in this direction and I go in this direction and I go in this direction, what you're doing is linking the two sides together with the right and left you know, up and down slightly, slightly, pitch slightly. And why do you want to pitch it slightly on the side position so it doesn't look so flat? And the other thing is when you move from side to side and you got, have this slight pitch and movement, what it brings in is the a ability to sink your elbow and relax your shoulder. Because if you just keep it here, your shoulder actually stays pretty uh, firm because you're holding it and just turning your wrist. So the fluidity, the wave of the movement can't be generated or created as a function of um, balance. Doesn't have the yin yang concept built into it because it doesn't have a downwardness. It doesn't rise and it doesn't fall. So with the rising and falling helps a lot with the, the wave energy. In the movement, 
that creates a wave energy actually is cycles. It's, it's a ripple and you can create that mo movement because it's cycling and it's not so flat and it's not so reciprocating as a motion. So a reciprocating motion is very linear and it goes back and forth like a piston. So if this was a piston, then it would just be doing this. But even this is not created without the elbow. Okay. So if you wanted a, a piston that really didn't require any of the body movements, you would go forward like this and go backward like this and go forward like this and backward like this. That would create a linear movement and it would be back and forth. But you know that when we do this form, when we stab and so forth, it doesn't just go back and forth like that. It's actually integrated with the body. Okay. So th those are just uh, ideas that you can kind of house in there. Keep gives you some food for thought. And when you practice it on your own, you, you can draw off of some of those ideas and then work with uh, your movements. <clears throat> okay, so here we are with the preparation and we have the mirror to kind of see that we're opening the form, turning the corner and grasp the sparrow's tail. Now we turn and we brush knee and push. Sit back, switch the hands, push the sword forward, we open as we step to here. One, two, three, four. Relax the shoulders. Relax and push. Relax the shoulder in order to push it up. Otherwise, you'll have conflict in motion and it's going to bind on you. Stab, flip the hand. Flip the sword, invert the sword like this. Your hand is hooked over here. Turn in this direction and then comes up with the foot. Switch feet and we end up like this. We poke down, waist cut, but then it goes up. So that went from horizontal to vertical over the head to that position. Step to here, lift up and chop down. Back to neutral, switch the feet, and we're here. Waist cut, set that up. So that's just set up for waist cutting. And then this is your forward lean position. Sit back, this goes to the back corner. This goes to the front position, neutral position, heel kick, vertical, push. Sit back, waist cut. Over the head, repeat that same movement, forward thrust. Sit and turn, lift up first, drop it down, pivot and turn. Sit back to neutral, turn to the side, horse stance, back to neutral, push it out, step through. So you have a push like this, we're going to turn and repeat these movements forward thrust sit back and chop turn and lift sit back cut up on this side sit back poke and here's the push the sword forward we push up and slice sit back one two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six. Now I made a turn, I'm facing the opposite direction. One, two, three, one, turn, Twist step, step out over the head, cross step, spin. Shift your stance. Now my left foot goes out. My left foot goes back. 
turn, lift, move the foot to here, in the stance, in the twist, in the cross step, and we're back. Switch feet again, plant the foot, step through, and poke. Okay, now I'm going to turn one, so that goes to the back corner, two, that lifting was unweighting, one, two. So the footwork is rise and fall until we get to here. Then we're going to go one, two, three, back to center, to here. Turn out, chop. You hold the back of the sword to divert. Shift your weight forward, pivot out. One, two, three. Push the sword forward. Cut to the throat or to the neck. This goes back to single whip, horse stance. And then we're here. It's actually not single whip, but the horse stance position. One, two, Three, four, five, shift, six, shift, hook, poke. And we're here. We go to the corner or to the front side. So these are corners relative to that position. Okay, so we're here. Just like in the beginning, we chop over there. Pull back, thrust, pivot to chop down. It can be like this or like this. And then you poke. We retreat, step back one, over the head two. This goes up to here. One, two, three, four, five, one, Two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two. Three, four, five. Okay, so that's the complete form. Uh, I think I did it fairly broken down and tried to uh, you know, execute and define sort of the transitional phases in the movement because, you know, it's fairly complex movement because you're moving your right side, your left side and upper body, your left leg and your right leg, or right leg and left leg, are moving in conjunction with the upper body. There's a relationship in the sword and the balance between um, you know, that upper-lower relationship. And you know, directing the blade in its appropriate direction. So poking is that stab. It could be like that. It could be like that. It could be like that. So these are, you know, just one on each side. This one's chopping down. So the chopping is like a hammer fist. This is what I call the uppercut because essentially your hand slices up. So it, whether it slices up to the front in the center line or slices and then draws back slightly for neutral is essentially the same vertical line because, you know, reference points, your nose, and your knee become part of that balance because you don't want to be poking outside of that line because of the accuracy and alignment of your position. You don't want to be slicing with the elbow up like this. You want the elbow slicing down like this as it crosses the body because the shoulder doesn't really like it if it's on an angular position, but it doesn't mind it if it's going over the top and you're releasing 
the collarbone, the clavicle area, if you're releasing the shoulder girdle, then it's okay to come straight up, just like your arm is walking. When you're walking, it's swinging like this. It doesn't like this because it's out of position. The joint doesn't really like that. Um, so if you, if you have some shoulder issues, it could be because you're moving your arm inappropriately in the wrong direction that's not compatible with typical um, natural motions of the shoulder. So your hip would be like that. Your knee, so these are your primary movers. So your knee would like be like that, your, your ankle, all these major joints that support uh, body load, body weight, really need to be in a, a good position. Otherwise, um, you can put wear and tear. You know, it's sort of like driving your car when your, t your, your wheels are unbalanced because there's going to be wear that's not tracking right. So, you know, when you don't track right, your joints will take um, some abuse. So we try to fix those, those things. But first you have to realize that that's what's happening and then you try to balance it out. So with Tai Chi, the leg work is so important, but the leg work is really learning to find the position. Um, one of the things that I talk about a lot is the tailbone should be dropping into near the heel position. So you're always going to be looking for that position. Like here, I'm in that position, then I'm in balance. If I'm over here, and my foot's over here, or I have too much weight here, my position is off, so it's going to be a little bit of trouble getting into that single-legged position. And then, so if you're in the single-legged position, you should be vertically, and you can see the uh, position there. When I'm like this, if you look at my position, this is my center, this is my front knee, and you can see that this is here. It's not here, it's not there, and it's not out there. It's here. When I'm sweeping around, I'll turn all the way down to the mirror. You notice my arms are parallel, but they're also centered. I don't have it over here or over here. These are positions that your body over time will start to uh, discover or connect with so your misalignment of position will fix itself si simply because those other positions are, are creating awkwardness and the inability to transition through it. So all of those things is just a function of practice and if you practice you'll start to figure out you know what those uh, positions are. Yeah. She feels like she's kind of faster in the kicks and the one to wait. And so she said she realizes the difference is the sword, the weight of the sword makes a difference in your balance when you come under the leg. That last kick or the first kick? Uh, the faster. Yeah. Well, the first kick is a little bit challenging because when you, when you poke like this, right, that's holding your position but then you have to relax and pull that together. So between this coordination and the leg going out and holding that position as it comes in becomes additional forces acting on your, your vertical position. So if you have too much coming, yeah. So if you have too much, so this has to sink back. So if, you, if you're in this position, okay, and you're going to, balance like this, so you find your balance position, okay, you have to relax the elbow first. So relax, just like we're here, that's relaxing. If you go like this, then it's going to create what we call moments. Moments are like forces on your, acting on your stability in a position. So like, so you're, because this is sticking out, it's cantilevered out into a space. So now when you change that position, you balance it with that. 
So you have to build some strength and flexibility. So it's the key thing, really, the flexibility is what part of that conflict. Because if this is uh, already c creating a problem with the kick, so in the, if you're kicking not too far, then it would just be like that. If you, the higher you go, the harder it is gonna, it's going to be to maintain that. So that's why. Um, but it's really, you know, the more physical this is, and the more physical this is, that's going to throw out your upper body uh, positions, and that's going to create the top heaviness uh, in a position. So when you're doing your kicks, this is lighter than you're doing it. You don't have this in your hand. So this is adding additional weight. So you have to compensate for that. But then when you pull into here, that's probably okay. But then when you push your foot out at the same time, you have to have your body react to counterbalance that movement. So it's a really part of the experience of doing that. But then it does, it is feel, fairly physical on one hand. And then on the other side of it, you have to learn to delete the excessive tension. So what do you have to do? You have to do it more and more till your body starts to identify with what extra stuff is in there. The, the erroneous tension or the excessiveness of how fast or how slow you pull it in. So it's really just playing around with it a little bit more. The under the leg one is actually a little tricky because the same thing, it's, it's really balanced and a little bit, of, you need some strength in this part of your thigh on the, up near the hip there because this is the muscle that lifts the leg. That muscle, you know, is uh, something that's engaging, so that has to be worked a little bit. You know, they, this muscle that's here, it might be the same muscle they call the tailor's muscle. So that's when they have their leg like that. But that muscle actually has to um, build some strength. But that comes from lifting and holding positions from lifting like that. And that muscle is going to get sore if you overwork it. And when that's sore, uh, you're going to have a little trouble lifting your leg in any direction, especially in Tai Chi when you step. So that muscle takes a beating sometimes. And that has to be stretched out here or here. You have to hold your leg here and stretch, you know, that, those groups of muscles. And I, I showed you this exercise at one time where you can do it at, you know, in, in your living room or you hook your foot on the edge of a chair or the edge of your bed and you just drop your knee and that stretches out your thighs because this, these muscles get very tight from sitting in your stances and those muscles will tend to become overworked as they get stronger, but at the same time, if you get a little bit of imbalance in the two muscles that support the leg so that it moves and turns, then it's going to pull your knee joint out of alignment. So you have to stretch that if your knees get sore from any of this uh, type of practice. Because when we go like this, there is a lot of weight on this leg. And one of the reasons why Tai Chi is good for you strengthening your legs is because it's a weight-bearing exercise. And if you support a good amount of weight on that leg, it's actually working to resolve the issue of weakness. So it will strengthen over time because your body will adapt. So that's one of the reasons. Um, any other question? Yeah, so, so leg work is important. Um, you know, when, we, when we're in a position, you know, when we're here, and we do this, you don't want to just quickly go like that. You want to control your movement. And when we lift, when we lift, you time it and capitalize on the fact that you just went up. So when you go up, you're kind of unweighting. And then you come back down. So, you know, if you ski, you know that you have to unweight. Why do you unweight? Because if you don't unweight and you have your body weight on the skis, you can't actually pivot them. You have to uproot or unweight to take the load off the apparatus, which is your skis, 
and it allows you to pivot. So it's a timing thing. So when you go like this and I up, up wait, I get to do that. So if you up, uproot, you can pivot. When you uproot, you can pivot and your feet will be doing that. So that's what's happening. So uprooting or lifting becomes uh, unweighting. So, so that's just you know some principles that uh, you can use as a as a correlation to something else that you do. I know Susan does you know skis or she did used to ski. That's what you have to do is control your body positioning by turning and turning, and it's, it's called lifting up up uprooting or up unweighting you know so when you lift like this you're unweighting and then you come back down you've made your turn and you poke so here we switch feet and you kind of replace the foot but don't just drop control it because that's how you build the relationship of passive action and, and softening the movement and gravity is always going to be acting on you. I don't know what this would be like up in the moon. You probably couldn't do this because you're weightless. So that's, uh, you know, the advantage we have is on Earth we have gravity working for us. So let's take advantage of that and not, you know, overwhelm the body with not being able to uh, work with that and allow gravity to cause conflict in your movement because you're always, you know, double weighted. Okay, on that note, I think it's about time. So hope you enjoyed that and I hope, you know, the uh, information was good. Give us a thumbs up. Hope to see you soon. Uh, next week we're uh, not streaming and we're, we're closed for the week. So uh, enjoy this video again next time.